Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Today we're going to talk about weather. Understanding and being able to predict weather and other environmental elements is important for safe and legal drone operations in Canada. We're going to cover six topics, starting with weather-related regulations for drones in Canada. Number two, sources of weather information, including aviation sources. And then four different consideration areas, temperature, wind, precipitation, and some other stuff. By the way, the presentation material that you'll see in this video has been incorporated into my study guide for advanced RPAS operations. If you'd like to purchase that package in a downloadable PDF format, check out the link in the description below this video. The Canadian RPAS regulations have weather-related elements built into many different parts. The main one is this first one. You must fly within the manufacturer's specifications for minimum and maximum temperature, maximum wind speed, and precipitation. And that's rule 901.34, section A. Closely related to that is the second one. You must be able to keep the aircraft in your visual line of sight, or VLOS. And that's 901.34, section B. And that really gets into flying into fog or clouds. You can't do those. Weather is also tied into pre-flight checks and planning. You must check the weather as part of your pre-flight checklist and site survey. And that's touched on in 901.24 and 901.27 section G. Also, you must consider weather when planning the flight's maximum range. That's 901.28. And finally, given that it's Canada, you must not allow ice or snow on your drone. That's 901.35. Don't get too hung up about that. They're not talking about a few snowflakes. They're talking about flying in situations where you, the aerodynamic capabilities of your drone are going to be compromised because of ice or icing conditions or the weight and, and, and impact of snow on your drone. Now, if you were a normal person, you would get most of your weather information from your phone. But you're not a normal person, you're a drone pilot. Wait, of course you're going to get your weather information from your phone, but there's some other things as well that we should touch on. So first of all, for your short-term forecasts, consider using more than one weather app on your phone. Weather apps may use different location data, they can update at different frequencies, and they may use different forecasting models. And having a couple of points of view might help you to avoid a problem. By the way, I'm not going to recommend a particular weather app. I am sure that you have one or more weather apps that you know, you love, and you can trust for the weather in your particular area. Go ahead and use those. If you're flying in an area that you're not familiar with and you're trying to plan your flight well in advance, you might want to look at historical weather trends to determine you know what's the what's the temperature usually like in in the Yukon at this time of year sort of thing and here's a link that will help you with that so you've checked your three apps you've decided everything's great you drive to your location and guess what it's completely different than anything you expected this can be the effect of microclimate the microclimate at your flight location can be very different than what your weather apps state. Terrain and buildings can affect local weather and temperature, and bodies of water can affect low altitude temperature and wind, and can induce local fog. So the key takeaway here is when you get to your flight location, you must use common sense, experience, and your own judgment to make your decision on flight safety. Don't fly just because your weather app says the weather is fine. As part of your on-the-site weather assessment, watch the clouds. Clouds can provide tremendous clues about imminent weather changes, particularly for anticipating storms. Rapidly towering cumulus clouds, like these ones, can turn into thunderstorms rapidly. Similarly, clouds moving in different directions from the surface wind can be an indication that there is a storm about to happen. Learn how to read the clouds to help plan your flights 
and to anticipate local weather changes. Here's a quick introduction to cloud identification. There's basically three dimensions in these clouds. There's the type of cloud, there's the altitude that the cloud resides in, and then whether or not it has precipitation. Let's quickly go through these. In terms of types, there's three. There's cumulus, which are the puffy clouds with distinct chunks. There's stratus clouds, which are generally solid looking or flat looking with no distinct features. And then there's cirrus clouds, which are the wispy ones. Cirrus clouds only exist at the highest of altitudes. Now, speaking of altitudes, there's three different altitudes that clouds can exist at. It's not a, you know, a distinct line, but roughly speaking, three altitudes. There's high altitudes, in which case the clouds will have zero as a prefix. There's middle clouds, which will have alto as a prefix. And then there's low clouds, and they have no prefix at all. So for example, a cumulus cloud at a low level is just cumulus. At a middle level, it's called alto cumulus. And if it's at a high level, which is called a mackerel sky, it's a zero cumulus cloud. Finally, there's the precipitation angle to this. And if, if a cloud has precipitation associated with it, it's got the word nimbus chucked in there for fun. So you can have um, cumulonimbus clouds, which are your typical rain clouds that you, dis, that you see as distinct uh, storms. And typically they are very tall and towering, often with this so-called anvil top to them. So they actually progress all the way through low, middle, and high uh, altitudes. And you can also have nimbostratus clouds, which are the solid banks of, of basically flat gray weather, just pouring rain as far as the eye can see. Okay, so those are the basic kinds of clouds and how you can identify them. This is very complicated. There's a lot of different variations. And if you look up at the, at the sky, hopefully you'll be able to distinguish between some of these things. And that way you won't be too surprised when you see an unusual cloud in the sky. So we've looked at sources of weather information in terms of apps. Um, we've looked at how you can use your eyes to understand the microclimate and looking at clouds and seeing how they can help you to predict uh, the weather. There's one other area that we need to talk about and that is manned aviation weather sources. I've got a list of these on the next page and they can provide accurate current weather information as well as forecasts, but honestly, they are not really of very high value to drone pilots. They typically apply only to the vicinity of airports or apply to higher altitudes, neither of which is likely where your flight is planned. And they are very cryptic and difficult to interpret as a result. That said, for some unknown reason, Transport Canada has determined that drone pilots must understand something about these aviation weather sources and so we should all expect to see questions on your RPAS exam related to aviation weather. Here are the main aviation weather services that are available. I think they specialized in obscure and strange acronyms when they came up with these. Notice that some of them are instantaneous sort of status reports on the weather like the METARs and we're going to talk about METARs a little bit more in a second. And other ones like the TAF, for example, are aerodrome forecasts. So some are, are current weather situations and other are, others are forecasts. We wouldn't be having fun unless we talked about METARs. So let's talk about METARs. They stand for Aerodrome Routine Meteorological Reports. They are issued for a specific aerodrome at a specific time, generally speaking, every hour on the hour and the data is packed into this obscurely coded block of, of stuff, as you can see in the middle of the screen here. Now, I, I'm gonna put out a, a separate video talking about, all about how to decode these METARs, but suffice it to say that you can see that there's an airport code, you can see the date and time, it gives you the wind, the visibility, stuff about the runway, the present weather code, like whether it's raining or whatever, as a code, 
um, the ceiling, temperature, all sorts of stuff. So it's all coded in there. And why you would use that if you're a drone pilot, I have no idea, but there you go. That's what a METAR looks like. And as I said, I'll put out a different video explaining how to decode these things. Okay, so that was sources of weather information. Now let's talk about different weather considerations with respect to temperature, wind, precipitation, and finally other things. Temperature considerations are fairly straightforward. You must not fly your drone outside of the manufacturer's specified safe temperature range. And you'll be able to see this in your instruction manual clearly spelled out. Temperature is a critical parameter for battery performance, particularly at cold temperatures, of course, both for duration as well as the ability to deliver, even at a full charge, sufficient energy to combat strong winds. And don't forget that cold temperatures can also make plastics brittle, such that a hard landing can create fractures or microfractures in your hull. And also note that the temperature at higher altitudes, even a little higher altitude than the surface, is generally colder than your surface temperature. So if you're close to that specification mark for your, uh, for your drone, be careful that the temperature up higher is not even colder. You must not fly when icing conditions are present. These are specified in rule number 901.35. And last but not least, ensure that both the pilot and the crew are dressed for the weather. And of course, we're talking about cold weather here. Make sure that you're wearing gloves or have some other accommodation so that you keep good dexterity in your fingers for good control of your craft. Now let's talk about the wind. Again, this isn't rocket science. You must not fly your drone in winds that exceed the manufacturer's specification. And remember that the local conditions, the terrain, trees, buildings, and even bodies of water can affect the local wind in terms of intensity and direction and gusting and things like that. Rule number 901.28 of the Canadian regulations mentions that your maximum flight range must be planned in advance prior to your flight. And what they really mean is that you you need to take into account headwinds and tailwinds and things like that. One tip that I have is that if at all possible, the outbound flight legs of your flight should be planned to be into the wind such that your return flight is with the wind and you won't be battling that wind when maybe you have low batteries. Earlier we talked about clouds and how you can use clouds to predict the imminent weather coming upon you. Similarly, the Beaufort wind scale can help you to understand the wind conditions locally based on common elements like how leaves are moving on trees, how flags are performing, and if you're near water, what the water looks like. So I recommend you become familiar with the Beaufort wind scale and in particular, note the, the level that is the maximum for your drone. So for example, a DJI Mavic 2 Pro, um, a fresh breeze, which is Beaufort level five here, about 30 kilometers per hour, that's getting close to the limit for the kinds of winds that that can sustain. I recommend that you learn the Beaufort wind scale, understand elements in your environment, and take those into account when flying. Unless your drone manufacturer specifically mentions it's okay to fly in precipitation, definitely avoid flying in rain, snow, fog, or mist. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of fun. Anyway, um, the point being, don't fly in the rain unless all of your equipment that's out there is rated to be tolerant to precipitation. And if your drone does get wet, or if you are flying in cold weather and you bring it indoors and you get condensation forming on your drone, allow it to air dry thoroughly before packing it away. Electronics and moisture are not friends. Our last topic today are two other environmental considerations that you should take into account when flying your drone. Geomagnetic storms and airborne sand, dust and dirt. Geomagnetic storms are disruptions in the Earth's magnetic field 
caused primarily by solar activity. These can impact your GPS positioning accuracy and in some cases radio communications as well, in particular between your controller and your drone. Now, geomet geomagnetic storm measurement is a very complex science. So for us mere mortals, the best we can do is use what's called the KP index. The KP index is a planetary average of the level of geomagnetic uh, storm activity on Earth. And simply put, you should avoid flying your drone if the KP index is four or higher. And various apps show you the KP index. You can go to the Space Weather uh, website and also get it. Drone Pilot Canada on their on the weather um, tab will indicate the KP index as well. In terms of airborne sand, dust, and dirt, just avoid it. This kind of stuff can damage your motors, it can damage your gimbal, and it can damage your camera directly. I would recommend that you use a launch pad when launching from loose material, whether that be dirt or sand or whatever, and definitely avoid flying into or through dust clouds. Well, there we have it. The weather and some other environmental considerations you should take into account before flying your drone. I think I better get inside.